Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of this Montessori Everywhere interview series featuring voices in the Montessori community in North America. Our guest today is Jackie Miller. Welcome, Jackie. It's so wonderful to have you here with us today. So from reading a little bit about your work, I was amazed by all the different pathways you have taken as a Montessori educator and practitioner. So you completed your AMI elementary training in the early 90s and then served as a Mont Montessori guide for 20 years, first working with elementary children and then later with adolescents. You became a leading developer of the adolescent program at Arbor Montessori School and contributed to the NAMTA, that's North American Montessori Teachers Association, as well as AMI Association Montessori International's Orientation to Adolescent Studies for 10 years as both a presenter and design coach. For the past seven years, you have been engaged in the work of adapting Montessori for transformative urban education. And you currently serve the Cleveland Metropolitan School District in a new position as the Director of Montessori Programming and Operations. And you previously were the founding principal of Stonebrook Montessori, a public charter school. Um, and currently you're serving on AMI USA's Board of Directors. And it's without a doubt from reading about you that you are dedicated to education as a means for social change, community development, and that your vision of Montessori transcends this current reality we're living in with the hope of really creating systemic change and reaching our full potential so that we can truly serve all children. We are so looking forward to this conversation with you today and thank you for being here. Thank you. Wow, that's quite a journey to hear someone else tell my story like that. Like, <laughs> wow. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. We are in this big work together and with, um, with great, aspirations for what um what we can what we can help bring about yes thank you thank you for that amazing introduction lily uh it is very impressive and it's true isn't it that when we hear somebody else kind of read off we kind of forget like wow wow i did i've been at this for a while so um so for me i just would love to know a little bit more of like why, you know, when did this journey start and, and what, what drew you to it and, and, you know, kind of your personal take on this uh, very amazing Montessori journey? Well, thank you for the opportunity to reflect on that. And, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I'm doing a lot of reflecting, right? Thinking um, <laughs> there is enough in my past for me to say, huh, what have I done and, and why? And what's, what have been some of the driving forces? So to go back then to the beginning, um, I was not, I did not set out to be an educator. Um, I, you know, I grew up in a military family. I am biracial, bi bicultural. My mother is German. My father is African-American. We lived in Europe for a good portion of my, um, of my childhood. Uh, of my, I calculated it recently. Of my four planes of development, I spent half in Europe, um, in Germany and in Belgium. And I am first generation college student, right? College graduate. My sister and I are first generation in our family. Um, and I was expected to, uh, to be a professional, right? To do something that would have esteem and that would make money. So education was not um, my, wasn't my top choice at the time um, as I was pursuing other options. Actually, my father had hoped that I would follow his footsteps and join the military, um, go to West Point and do that. Um, and actually, just a quick little aside, um, Daddy's 80th birthday was a year ago, and, and I had the opportunity to reflect on how my life has been a life of service, not military service, but service nonetheless. And, um, and I was married to, uh, a, you know, a, a, someone who was in the military. And so that's a big part of who I am and how I um, grew up in my connection to the military community, but not, right, but I'm waging peace instead of waging war, which is not what the military believes itself to do, right? The military is a culture of striving for peace. However, the means, I think, are not aligned with the ends. So 
anyway, that's just a little aside about how important it is to me to to acknowledge, um, you know, the service of um, of my family members and others in the military, and to to know that we can that we are working toward waging peace in in different ways. Uh, so. So then the choice, however, while I was resisting being an educator, I was doing a lot of work with children and just loved being with children and loved um, the energy. Um, and so while I was doing my day job, I was also doing um, after school, supporting an after school program, even in college, I did that. And then working at a, um, uh, believe it or not, a weekend and evening child care center um, while I was doing some early work in, um, in my early 20s. So then, you know, learning about Montessori through a colleague who was having a wonderful experience of Montessori with her child, um, and just learning about Montessori as as education as a means to social change, not education as for its own sake, but as this part of this bigger vision of social change. Um, that's always the way I have perceived of Montessori and of education. Right? It's not just classroom technical practical. Uh, classroom skills. It is in service of a bigger change of, of, of our social structure, right? She calls for a reconstruction of society and that education is the means to that end. So that's always what has motivated and inspired me about Montessori. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I got, that's how I, I found it. I fell in love with her. What a remarkable woman, right? She was a first in so many ways and you know, she's at she's she's on my list of people I'd love to invite to dinner. Right? Have you ever done that exercise where you know? Oh yes, she's, she's <laughs> on the top of my list, definitely. Yes, mine too. <laughs> yeah, so we'd just love to know her. Um, you know what motivated her, and it was it was living in a world where change needed to happen. I mean, being mm. kind of, who contributes to who sees a vision of what how things can be and. Um, and you know, dedicated her life to to that, to to creating a reality and creating processes by which people could move um, in a direction of of our greater good. So she continues to be someone I um, am inspired by, and um, so that's that's the actually word. that that brings up a question, and this is kind of it's not on our list of questions, but I often I often wonder I often wonder this and ponder about. Uh, Maria Montessori being a woman that, you know, at, at the time and such, do you, like, have you ever reflected on the, on the, on the fact that, that she was a woman and would have been, would our educational system be different today had she been a man in that time? Mm. Like, I, I've always thought like the, this whole, like, that we weren't given, you know, I mean, it, she, she fought for equal rights for women, you know, during her lifetime as well. And I just, sometimes I always wonder, like, would we, would we have listened to her more <laughs> had it been a Mr. Montessori as opposed to Maria? That's interesting to reflect on. And the answer is probably yes. But then I have to ask the counter question of would she have come to these realizations and had this vision had she been a man at that time because of because of roles and gender roles and societal expectations i think it's not a coincidence that she was a woman right that the, the kinds of insights and and bringing in the kind of um, focus on justice and love right it's how much she talks about love and the nurturing and the the championing the cause of children who at the time, right, it all started with children who were cast aside by society, who were deemed to be unteachable. And her commitment to honoring the dignity of those children, um, right, that's a very feminine capacity for nurturing and care that I think is at the heart of, of this movement. Um, and also then um, the inspirations in her life and some of the, the experiences she had and, and a connectedness to, there's a very collective, so we're you know, in the space of equity and culture and really understanding and, and growing in our um, awareness of um, 
you know, dominant culture and, and voices that are left out, there is a very collectivist um, uh, root in Montessori. It's very much influenced by collectivist culture and, and other cultural ways of being that were not, that are not as deeply rooted in European culture as in some other cultures, right? And so the fact that she was a European woman who pushed barriers and boundaries and then had experiences in other um, countries in contact with other cultures, namely a lot of the work in India later in her life, all of those interesting factors, and you know, and now with social justice, we talk a lot about intersectionality, and we have a new awareness of who we are and how the different parts of who we are intersect to give us a particular perspective. So, yes, we might have listened to her more; she might have gotten more credit, but she was who she was, and it's that unique intersectionality that that birthed this kind of, um, you know, the vision for for this particular movement which is aligned with some other cultural ways of being that were already around and already out there too. So. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's a great point. I had never like thought of it that way because it's true. Like she would have been, you know, probably would have been a doctor like all the other men that she was in school with. So thank goodness she, she was a woman and she is a woman. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Lily. All right. So obviously we three here know about Montessori. We love it. Whether you view it as a pedagogy, a system of education, a philosophy, a way of life. Um, and I presume that most of our viewers who will be watching this interview will know about Montessori, whether they're trained, whether they send their children to Montessori schools. But we were just wondering, what are some key phrases or key words that you use when you are explaining Montessori. Excuse me, Lily, sorry. Would you yeah. mind repeating that? The, you, you blurted out my internet. Oh, sure. Just repeat the question. Thank you. Yes. So we were wondering if there are any key words or phrases that you use in your explanation of Montessori education to others when you might be talking about it and they, and they don't know very much about it. So we were just wondering any, any key words or phrases that you might use. Oh, the old elevator speech, right? The, the, the one did you say to bring people on board when, when right. what we want to do is have an hour long conversation about Montessori, <laughs> um, which is interesting because in my work right now in the public sector, um, in Cleveland specifically with the public schools here, it's important to speak the language that others understand, right? Montessori, we, we tend to have some jargon um, that we that makes it hard to communicate. So, you know, Mar Montessori at its heart is a developmental approach to education. And what that means is that we, we look at the child and we, um, you know, pay attention to what is the natural development of the human. And then we look at education as aiding that, supplementing that right? Taking that into consideration, as opposed to looking at a curriculum for a body of knowledge and ha having that be the driving force. Now, those two things come together, of course, but we are, um, you know, Montessori looks at the developmental characteristics and that is our guide for how we do what we do. Um, and then child-centered, right? So the child is at the center and also whole child. So it's not just academic, it is whole learning. So, and that whole child then brings in a very holistic and hands-on kind of an interactive and engaging way to learn, right? that it is um, experiential learning as much as, as it possibly can be and developmentally um, connected and appropriate to each age group. Um, and then the other thing that I think is always important to bring in to talking about Montessori is the, the relationship between the teacher and the adult. And we, I, I try to bring up as often as I can that our, our triangle, right? The child, the adult, and the, the physical environment. And there are others, you know, there's other ed educational pedagogy that also looks at that instructional core. Um, and, and so it's a little bit different in Montessori in, in the proportions of that and how those things interact with each other. And one of the keys is the relationship between the, the adult and the child. And that, that it, there is, we minimize the power differential there. Right? And so when it's child-centered, it means that we, the adult, is 
you know, we're on that same level, literally, we get at their eye level with little people, right? So literally, we're on the same level as learners. And we, of course, we have a more experience. And of course, we have the responsibility to prepare learning environments. But then we and then we uh, trust the child and give a great degree of freedom and autonomy to the child to guide their own learning. Um, you know, we, we're the stage manager, we're behind the scenes, as opposed to um, leading that work. Um, so there's a so there's a difference in the power and the relationship and the the the, uh, the trust of the child to know what they need to pursue what they need and to um, and to then give us feedback, right? And then we take their feedback. So it's just, it's just, it's a different uh, cycle of connection between the adult and the child, with the learning being at the center of it. Beautiful. I love I, I love that the, the 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 power. You know what that they, it's really on an equal level, and 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 it is so true because we you know we are taught to come down to their level and. And I remember what, as, as a new teacher, um, how I, f I forget, I think I had put a mirror up so that I could, you know, check myself or something. And the, the trainer that came into my classroom went, who is this for? You know, and it wasn't for the child. This was the prepared environment for the child. So there was no room for that mirror up there. And, and I remember like, yes, okay. So this, <laughs> I bow down. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. I appreciated that sort of acknowledgement of the sort of different exchange of power because really it's a mutual exchange of, of energy mm -hmm. sort of moving through that that triangle we, we talk about so much. So thank you. So, so Jackie, if you could um, kind of help us or I mean, I know you've done a lot of work in the public sector uh, and, and now with uh, Montessori in the public sector. How can we, um, you know, all of all the people interested in Montessori and bringing it to the masses of how can we make Montessori education um, more accessible, uh, especially in, in maybe communities that, you know, are underserved? Because I know that there is this, you know, stigma on Montessori that, that I see all the time that it is for the wealthy and, 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 and unfortunately, you know, it has become that a little bit. So, you know, what, how are you working to make sure that it is accessible to all communities? Thank you for that question. And um, that's, that's big. And there are many, many factors that come into that. Um, you know, one, I think it starts with an intentionality, right? So thank you for the question. The more people ask the question, the more answers will present themselves, right? If we could ask the question, then you will, you will hear and you will know about opportunities to support Montessori where public funding can be leveraged so that it is accessible to more, um, to more students and families. Um, I think there are a number of dynamics there, you know, for a while. So... <laughs> Transformation, right? So in my work in public sector, I because I spent 20 years teaching in the private sector and I I learned so much and I grew from that experience and and I brought everything I knew into my public work and there was a lot I didn't know, right? So number one, there's a humility that I think has to be one of the first steps is is to be to be humble and recognize that because Montessori has thrived in these set settings where it has had to, you know, where people have had to pay for it more often than not, right? In the private sector where people can afford to pay for it has created a niche in which it's grown and it's been powerful and we know that it works and we know that that is a limitation to access. So then to think about how to expand and replicate Montessori and grow into other spaces where where people don't have to pay for it. So then where does the funding come from? Well, with public funding come other requirements and other expectations. And so there's a lot of work. Like it is harder, and I will just humbly say, it is harder to do Montessori in the public sector, right? And I think I didn't, 
I wasn't humble enough to understand that before. In the private sector, my perspective was that, well, you know, to do Montessori well, this is where it needs to be. And now I recognize that to do Montessori well, it needs to be in more places so that we get more insight from more communities and cultural experiences about how Montessori should look and what it looks like to do it well. And therefore, we need really creative and hardworking people to to break down those barriers to right to solve those problems like how do we get funding so then when we can do that and in 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 public districts there are so many districts in this country where Montessori has been around for a long time and it you know they run the gamut of the challenges right public funding comes with changes in administrations it comes at the whim of some you know of policy public policy so now we need to also be knowledgeable about educational policy and how does that work and how is funding um, available and is there enough funding? You know, Montessori tends to um, cost more in some important ways, right? We have um, more staff, right? With a teacher and an assistant in a classroom of 25 or 30, that's a higher ratio. So then you're going to have a different set of costs to establish and maintain a, a public school, uh, a Montessori school. And so then how does the public sector grapple with the differences in funding, right? Um, so there, there just are so there are many obstacles to to jump over. Right. I used to hurdle in high school. So I'm like, a, a hurdle is not a problem. It just means you got to be skilled enough to jump over it. Right. You got to clear that hurdle to make it available. Um, you know, teacher training. Right. Adult preparation needs to also prepare us for that work and that greater diversity. You know, in private schools, it's not uncommon to say you know, we don't have the services to support this child with special needs. And so I'm sorry, they're not going to be able to be admitted to our school. Well, what in the public sector, we eliminate that. If we want greater access, we change that. So then how do we create the schools where we have the services, where we have either the partnerships or whatever that looks like, or the individual teachers have some training in special needs so that we can support a wider variety of, of children? Right. So we've got to push. We've got to know better what it takes to do Montessori in the places where it isn't currently abundantly available and then develop those skills and capacities to create the access um, teacher training. Right. How do we get more people with different predispositions? Right. Maybe more people from special ed who are going to then learn Montessori and provide that more cultural representation from people of color, global majority, knowing and, and understanding and valuing Montessori to be able to get the training. What does training need to be able to do? Because there's an access, right? There's a cost. There's a, you know, how, where do you go? How do you put your life on hold? So these are all multiple layers of, of challenges around access that have to be addressed um, and are going to be different, right? Every state has different charter rules, for example. Charter regulations are different. So it takes a different understanding depending on which state you're trying to open a school in. And then and then school districts have a whole nother set of you know things to learn and understand. So there's not there's not even a one size fits all. It's it's we need lots of examples in lots of places where lots of people are solving the unique problems to their specific reality so that we can um, have more. We just need more and more places. Yeah, I just have a follow up on on that is is you, you know, you talk about teacher training and also about educational policies. Does the does Montessori in the public sector uh, have a place at the table to to kind of sway a little bit the educational policies and and also, for example, the the teacher training like or can we make it accessible in, you know, community colleges, for, for example? I mean, uh, are, are those things also being looked at or, or not? Yes. And do we need more of all of that? Yes. Um, so here in the U.S., the uh, Montessori Public Policy Initiative, MPPI, is an organization. It's a um, collaborative effort, um, AMI, AMS, and I believe maybe a couple of other organizations are represented as well, but came together to say, how do we, how do we create some common um, language so that we can look at the, um, it, they started specifically focused on the early childhood regulations um, in, uh, across the country and in various states. They're doing some work around um, teacher licensure pathways so that um, 
educators with Montessori training, what does it look like in different states to be able to get a teaching license? Because you have to have both. Um, well, you have to have the teaching license. Um, we want everybody to also have the Montessori training. So, and that's one of the one of the things we're working on right now in Cleveland is how do we bring training here so that um, school staff can um, public district school staff can um, get their Montessori credential in addition to their teacher um, license. When we started the, the charter at Stonebrook, we had Montessori trained teachers and needed a pathway for them to get state licensure. So you have to, uh, again, there are requirements of, of this nature. Um, in terms of being at the table for other conversations, um, you know, with uh, trainings, there are a number of different training centers that are working with universities and doing collaborative work. So it, yes, it's happening, um, again, in lots of different places with little initiatives that are growing. I think they're growing to try to tackle the problems or the, the, the challenges because they're different. They are different in different places. So will we at some point get to where there is a national um, representation? That would be lovely. <laughs> that would be lovely. Um, there is a nice, uh, I'm part of a, a, a growing network of um, district level Montessori coordinators. So my position in Cleveland is with the school district, which is the first time Cleveland has had that, um, a role so that there is a Montessori voice at the table within the district. There are several other districts that have that as well. Um, South Carolina, interestingly enough, has a Montessori representative at their, in their state level Department of Education, which I just recently found out. So those are all, um, possibilities and opportunities to be part of, of bigger conversations around education. Wonderful. It's a lot of hope is yeah. from, from what you're sharing. Beautiful. There's some moves in the right direction, it sounds like. Absolutely. All right. Well, moving on from that topic just a little bit, um, you know, obviously we're living in a global pandemic right now still, and in an increasingly digital age and digital world, and during this time, the classroom, the workplace have had to adapt to these online formats. And so I'm wondering some of your thoughts on how we can embrace these changes as we continue to move forward. And do you anticipate any challenges? Um, and furthermore, uh, just to add to that a little bit, do you believe that there's a place for technology in our work? Mm, that's a doozy you added on the end there. <laughs> so, you know, I have not been in the classroom in, in during this experience of the pandemic. So when it first started, we were just at the end of the school year. I was still the principal at Stonebrook and we, um, we recognized the need to adapt. We went to our Montessori principals. He said, okay, you know, how do we maintain relationships with our children? How do we utilize technology to create, um, you know, to be in connection and create learning opportunities. Um, obviously, we can't do all of our wonderful materials, um, but how do we continue to stay in a learning relationship and keep learning going with our, with our students? That two months at the end of last year has turned into a whole year now. Um, Cleveland Metropolitan Schools have all been remote all year, um, and the challenge is, is immense. It is not the same. Um, it is not the same dynamic. It is not the, we don't have as much um, ability to prepare our environment. So now we, we are in a different, you know, we, the educators are in a different physical environment than the children are in. And so how do we do that? Which is a primary role for a Montessori educator is to prepare the environment. So we've limited, we've been limited in our ability to do that and have had to really shift gears. The opportunity in it, I think, is, and what I've seen people doing, is being very creative and, and adapting, right? We have the benefit of being a, a principle-driven pedagogy, right? We know our Montessori principles, and even when we can't use those beautiful materials, we can think about another material to use. We can think about another way to have an experience with angles, even if I don't have that beautiful box of geometric sticks at my disposal, right? Because we, we know child development, we know what learning looks and feels like in a way that we can be adaptable. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not, um, <laughs> it doesn't go unnoticed by any of us that that's one of the things Montessori has as an outcome, right? Is adaptability because our world is unpredictable. We know that. And so we don't, 
we don't see outcomes of specific content knowledge. We see outcomes of capacities for learning. So we've had to live into that, <laughs> and it's been it's been a challenge. Um, and so, you know, I am humbled by the work of Montessori educators and by the way that the Montessori community has has risen to the challenge to be creative and to do just that, to adapt to this new way of being. Um, I also recognize that we all are eager to be in classrooms and to the various extents that people have been able to do that and then being creative about how do we change how we do things in our classrooms so that we take into these uh, take into consideration all of the additional constraints around safety. Um, and interestingly enough, the children are much more adaptable, right? They, we're gonna do it this way now. Oh, okay, this is the way we do it. We give them a good explanation for why and that this is our new protocol for how we are together. Um, it's been harder for the adults, I think. Um, so, you know, all of that being said, I. I don't have any greater morsels of wisdom except that that is where we find ourselves and we have been um, open to that and adapting to that in a joyful way. As we think about the future, one of the things to notice is that this virtual, like the use of technology has had benefits, right? It has had a positive side and, and in any school's experience, like I, I wish, I hope, Lots of people are taking lots of notes about what are the benefits that you're seeing? What are the ways that this tool of communication and connection has been supportive of your children? And where are you seeing children thrive? Um, I know that in the public um, sector, in the, in the work here, you know, we, we work with a lot of children who have um, who've experienced trauma, for whom being in a, a, an in-person space, there are lots of things that activate an overly sensitive nervous system that are not there when they're working from home and working remotely. There are children who have utilized the tools as self-correcting and have exercised their freedom to be able to move through things quickly when it's when they're using online platforms. And so they're analogous to some of the things they're offering some of the same benefits that our classroom materials offer. So there are just I, I just I hope that people are being oh, uh, attentive to what's working instead of just hoping we go back to the way things were like we can't go back we've got to go forward with new information right as Montessorians we are to be scientific pedagogues we are to observe what are we observing that's working and how might we hold on to those things like I hope we do you know it is you know, it's, it's 21st century technology is a is absolutely a part of of our lives do we believe still that children under six probably shouldn't be spending a whole lot of time in a virtual space. Yep, still believe that. But are there new and engaging ways that we can use technology as tools, especially for elementary and for adolescents that maybe we weren't fully utilizing and hadn't allowed ourselves to embrace before? Yep, I think that's true too. So I hope that, yeah, I hope we, we learned from this and, and then develop ways to, to utilize tools to their advantage, right? To what they're what they're intended to do, what they're good at doing, and limit them to that, <laughs> as we always have, right? They don't take the place of sensorial experiences. Certainly, for the for the sensorial learners, they don't take the place of that by any means. But but they can be powerful tools for for elementary and adolescents. Absolutely. Thank you for that response. And you know, something that came to mind while. Well, you were talking about um, particularly with elementary or adolescents that are using, you know, media and, um, so, you know, social platforms, social media um, in environments. We talk so much about grace and courtesy and how to be in community with one another in person. So I'm wondering if you think that right now, given these changing circumstances, that we have a responsibility or if we have a responsibility to um, talk to children about how to engage in these social communities, but online. Absolutely, like <laughs> without a doubt. And that's a conversation that the adolescent community was having anyway, right? Even before this, because technology is a much bigger part of, of the social life of, of adolescents. And so digital citizenship is a thing, right? We have to talk about it. And within school communities, um, you know, there, that has to be part of the code of, of 
conduct, your code of ethics, your, your how we interact and, and connect with one another. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's never going to benefit Montessorians to 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 deny technology. And Montessori herself, you know, in, in her writing and at, in her time, technology was increasing immensely. And you know, she cautioned us to to use technology to serve us rather than us being you know beholden to technology and not letting it control our lives. And you know. 10 years ago when I was working with adolescents, we had these conversations with, with families, you know, parents, should I, should I get them a cell phone? If they have a cell phone, should I take it away at a certain time at night? Like, of course, these are rules. These are, you have to have rules of engagement with technology. It is not neutral, right? Technology is not neutral. Um, and so citizenship and morality um, and, and developing an ethic around how we engage with technology absolutely is critical. Thank you for that. That is that is so so important, and I think it is a conversation even in the tech world that is that is happening more and more these days of just you know how how we have to be careful to not let it overtake us. So thank you for that. Um, one thing that that in our Montessori trainings we we talk a lot about and focus on is this notion of the preparation of the adult, of the role that we play. Um, and I we would love to know a little bit of how, how you perceive that, like how you define that, the, the preparation of the adult. And maybe if you can tell us maybe some, some personal practice that, you, that have become maybe vital for you um, in your work with, with Montessori educators, families, and children. Wow. Um, the preparation of the adult is, uh, I'm passionate about that topic and continue to learn about it. I think, so I think it starts in training. I think Montessori training needs to really help us recognize what it means to be a lifelong learner, right? We say that, but are we really open to learning? always, right? which means also being open to examining our own practice and our own beliefs. Right? If we're open to learning, then that means we're open to growing, right? And that this transformation, there's a sense that Montessori training is a transformative experience, which it absolutely is, but it doesn't end when you finish. Right? It's kind of like Montessori training is the first period. You've gotten all your direct instruction and now you've got to go and you've got to do your own work. And that, that is an ongoing process. So the continual spiritual preparation of the adult. I'm not sure I completely grasped that as my responsibility when I left training. So I think there's a place for that to really be communicated. And in addition, the other sort of piece of identity as a Montessorian that I think is important for the adult to have is that we are scientists, right? That we are social scientists, that observation and, and to not... And what that implies is that we don't know everything. <laughs> right? We're always looking for more insights. We're always observing this, the child and ourselves. And that, and that, that dynamic, we have to look at our own practice. And, and she does call us to do that. But again, I'm not sure I had that as strongly grasped when I left training as I've come to, to appreciate over time. Um, you know, and I think right now in the world, as we recognize how much of a role um, dominant culture and implicit bias and explicit bias, <laughs> like like real biases, play in our in the way that we show up, um, I think we have to recognize that spiritual preparation of the adult means always being open and humble to doing the personal work. Um, to make sure that we're showing up with the most open mind and the most open heart and that we're committed to the, to the, to the values of Montessori. Um, I think right now a lot of people are, are doing work around equity and um, cultural proficiency. Hey, where do I stand? What do I know? How do my beliefs, my unexamined beliefs show up in how I show up? Um, and to, to examine that. And I think one of the things that maybe has um, 
put me on that path is I like I'm a self-help person. Like I love to read books about, you know, growing and improving myself and um you know, and I have I have a, a personal practice of you know, trying to be very reflective and you know setting goals and then evaluating, you know, what was this year of my life about and what what can I do next and what are my, you know, how do I want to grow? Um, so being a just being a learner, right? That that sense of being a learner and really truly being open to um, the need um, and the opportunities for growth. And when I'm not open to them, usually the universe sort of slaps me upside the head with some new challenge that gives me an opportunity to grow, <laughs> even when I didn't want to. <laughs> so I think that's, um, those are my thoughts. Did I address your question completely? Uh, yes, yes, you, you did. And there was, there was the, the part of, of maybe more personal practice. You did, you did mention um, kind of the reflective uh, work that you do. I was just also wondering like, day to day, is there something that like wise words that you would have for maybe new, new teachers that are, you know, that are coming out of training um, because I know for myself and, and, you know, this is just a, a personal reflection. I, I entered Montessori as an older guide, I will say, because I, I went back to school in my early forties. I already had children. Um, it was really hard to, you know, to, to kind of retrain my brain, retrain all of this. And, and the work that I've, you know, progressed into is really supporting and encouraging parents more, because I feel that there is, and I love what you say about, you know, kind of this lifelong learner, because for me, initially, it was to be with the children. And, you know, I didn't really want to deal with the parents, I just, you know, drop off your children, the children are doing fine in the prepared environments and all this, but I, I quickly realized just how much nurturing the parents needed. And I felt that, we weren't trained to do that. We were, and, and, and I was actually reflecting yesterday on Montessori's Decalogue and changing some of the, uh, some of the passages with parent as instead of child. And, and, and it was like, yes, like this is how we need to be treating, you know, parents with more grace and courtesy, with more patience that we've trained ourselves for the children so for me that spiritual preparation is is how we deal with with humanity altogether so you know it, it's what you say is just point on with with what I've been reflecting lately so thank you and I and I think and so you make me think more about that connection amongst adults right we do we think okay I'm going to be a Montessori educator and I'm going to be relating to children but there's also like we have to lift our heads up and recognize that oh we're also a community of adults within a school right and how do the adults relate and respond to each other as professionals and then how do we connect and relate to and value parents and their perspectives and their reality right they don't drop their kids off at the door and and then and then just walk away from that um, and the kids don't come in and and leave their family experience at the door either and so. I, the last several years here in, in my work here in the public sector, I've really come to value more and more the role of parents and the need to be able to, um, as a Montessorian, right, thinking about other adults with the same kind of compassion and empathy that we cultivate for children. And acknowledging, right, we, we, we meet children where they are, we have to meet other adults where they are too. Um, and so, yes, so cultivating all of those, um, those capacities to connect with other humans and value them, respect them, and hear them. Right? And so I think one of the aspects of, of, of developing that that I've been exploring is um, restorative practices. And there's a, there's a sense of how, how do people come together and have communication, have dialogue, and grapple with conflict. Um, and it, this came out of our uh, adolescent work too. We did a lot of that with our middle school students. You know, how do we have conversations about hard things? How do we meet when we don't agree and get to the place where we find where we do agree and then navigate 
to get to an end together. Right? We want to build something together. We want to, and with the adolescents, it's, you know, we're going to do our beekeeping project and we're going to do this together, but we disagree about how we're going to get there. So how do we, how do we have those hard conversations and, um, and, and acknowledge people's perspectives and respect their perspectives and then figure out how are we going to collaborate and work together? Um, so those are, those are important skills to cultivate. Right, in, in creating, as I say, it, I'm thinking about all the different ways that larger society needs more people who can hear each other, disagree with each other, and and work together toward um, what we can, um, what we share, our goals that we share. Um, another thing that came up as I was thinking about um, that personal, the sort of personal development has to do with courage, right? Montessori talks a lot about humility. I continue to work on what it means to be humble <laughs> and continue to be surprised in situations where I recognize I'm not as humble as I think I am. <laughs> oh, there it is again. Um, but humility, true humility, and that true humility requires real vulnerability and real courage. Right? And so I think those are two places, um, two things to cultivate. Right? I love Brene Brown's work around vulnerability and and courage and brave, being brave, um, right? To, to make change in this world, to, to push against dominant culture, to stand um, for what we believe takes courage and vulnerability. Beautiful, thing. thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, you speaking about vulnerability really, um, I, I'm also quite a fan of Brene Brown and I really think that being vulnerable allows us to truly connect with one another. Like, I, I think it is a key to powerful and meaningful connection between humans. Yep, I agree, I agree. And that's ultimately what, what, what we need, right? And what we want, and we wanna create communities where true connection really is happening. Because when you can really, you show up, it's safe, you can connect, that's when you can be courageous. That's when you can be a learner. And being a learner is very vulnerable. Right? Dang, I don't know something. And oh, tell me more about that. That's an absolute place of vulnerability. So our students are in vulnerable positions all the time. So for us to join them there, right, and be vulnerable with one another, colleagues, I mean, how often do Montessorians have a sense of, you know, really being able to be open and honest and collaborative with colleagues um, and then bring parents into that, right? And parents often expect us to be the experts and know all the answers, but, but we're in all of this together, learning together. So. Absolutely. And just that conversation of, um, you know, connecting with the parents and having compassion for them and with our colleagues and other adults, just as we do for children, I think is, is such an important thing to be talking about here. And I, I really appreciate that being mentioned today. And, you know, um, that relation, those relationships being just as important as our relationships to the children. And, you know, hearing all about the things that you've done in your career, Jackie, it's really, um, it's quite inspiring because we might come into this work thinking we're just going to be Montessori teachers. We're just with the children, but the different paths that we can take and the ways that our roles can kind of transform over time. Um, it's quite amazing. So um, it's nice to hear about all of the things that you have done and have been involved in, and hopefully it will inspire some others to sort of reach their potentials as, as educators and as, as people in the Montessori world. So I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I would love to know, just as, as we wrap up, you were talking about, you know, how you, you reflect and you set goals and, and such. What, um, what is, what are you, what are you working on right now? Like, what are you excited about and what, what is kind of your, your uh, long-term and, and short-term vision for Montessori education? Oh my. Um, let me say one thing real quick before I answer that. And Lily, the comment you just made made me remember, right, to, to say out loud that I think I've been using language. I want to make sure that I don't leave it with language that, um, you know, being compassionate with parents somehow. I want to make sure that it's clear that, that there's not a deficit, right, that, that 
there is also a mutual benefit, right? When we connect well with parents, with our colleagues, we, we gain because they have funds of knowledge, they have wisdom, they have insight that, that will help us do our job better. Like I, want, I just wanna make sure that it doesn't feel like, again, we know and we're gonna support them, but that that connection, that real partnership with families and with other Montessori colleagues builds us because they have insights that we wouldn't otherwise have. So I wanted to make sure to say that. Absolutely, you know, I, I always feel and will say to parents when I'm in this situation that they know their child the best. <laughs> so that, that's definitely important too acknowledge thank you well communities right what works for this community what's important for, for this group of people so okay so then vision and goals and what's on tap um this work in cleveland uh with the district is new and big and there's great potential here there is um a, a well-established montessori school in the district that has a long history of, of people working hard here to um, have Montessori have a presence in the district. And the second school is a merger of the charter and a, a traditional school. So Stonebrook Montessori has merged with the neighboring school and it is going to be a Montessori campus. And so I have the opportunity to help develop a model, right, the Montessori model for the school district um, that both schools will, will lean into. Um, the, that will, the schools will go through middle school. They both have middle school. I would love, and this is not official, but I would love to see it go through high school. So I hope that that is a conversation we will be able to have, um, as a personal aspiration. Um, and then I'm, and so I, I, I am excited about what the possibility will be in Cleveland to really collaborate here and, and, and craft a space so that this district really is, um, an example. Uh, and, and an exemplar in a commitment to Montessori in the public sector. So in addition to that, um, I'm excited about the opportunity to serve on the AMI USA board and the human rights and social justice committee of that board is, is a place of passion for me. Um, I'm, I have a dream and a hope that um, there can be a more intentional space for, um, so there is a Montessori uh, Institute for the Science of Peace that was established in Cleveland some years ago that's been dormant. And there are some conversations about bringing that back um, and expanding that as a place to, to, to do some official work around peace. Um, in Cleveland with a colleague, Natalie Celeste, we've been working with the Peace Literacy Institute. So peace is a passion for me. And how do we formalize and bring it in with and, and make it real? Like, how do we do the work of justice that will create the conditions for peace. Um, so educational equity around um, in, all, in all the different ways. Um, and then it brings back in sustainability and really an intentional way to continue to learn um, about what we can be doing to formalize educational settings to prepare people for the, um, you know, for adult contributions around justice, around increasing justice and um, social justice, environmental justice in our world. So that sounds vague because there are things that I I don't know exactly and I don't have goals set exactly, and, which is kind of a funny thing in my life. I say that I set goals, but really, and I, I set intentions, like I want to be doing more peace work. <laughs> and then the, and then I wait to see what what presents itself. And so it's not that there's an explicit goal, it's more of an intention. And then I, I say yes to opportunities that come up. Um, so, so those are the places that I'm really passionate in um, expansion of public Montessori and more work around the science of peace. Well, beautiful. And, 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 I, and I have to just thank you for, for just being an inspiration and, and, you know, I think, I think that when we hear you, it's, it's, we want to get involved as well. And it's just, you're, you're doing amazing work. I have been an admirer of your work for, for many years. So thank you for the, your generosity to the Montessori community and to, to the, to humanity as a whole. So thank you. Truly. Thank you. Um, such an inspiration to hear your words. And I couldn't agree more with Jen Marie that we, you're, you're reeling us in and making us want to be part of um, 
you know, peace and peace education as much as we, we can be. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you for receiving it in that way. I can't wait to hear what you do in your place because it's <laughs> not work to do, believe me. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this, this wonderful conversation for Montessori Everywhere uh, Voices. It has been a pleasure speaking with you today, Jackie. Thank you for this work and for bringing these to the community. What fun. <laughs>